stuff. Uh, but welcome no everyone. Uh, I've got a friend of mine, an old teammate, Andy Marshall, had a distinguished career in the game and now has moved to the coaching side, the, the dark side, but <laughs> the, the, the mature side. Um, for younger viewers and listeners, um, Andy has, has a long career, 20 year career, playing career, obviously involved before as a youth team and, and afterwards as a coach, was a player. Um, am I right saying you joined Norwich as a trainee in 1992? Uh, made your debut just after that with 190, 195 appearances, roughly. Then made a move to Ipswich in the Premier League, 53 roughly appearances. Then joined joined me at Millwall for, for a little while. Coventry in amongst there was played for England under 18s and 21s, which uh, what an achievement that is. Um, and then um, moved to Aston Villa and then decided to turn to coaching. Um, about 450 appearances, is that right, Marsh? That's about right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's correct. For anyone who knows the game, uh, obviously uh, an outstanding amount of games uh, played. Um, a, a very kind of distinguished and um, remarkable career, which obviously I was gifted to play with Marshy, so, uh, which I learned a lot as a, as a young kid. So welcome, Marshy. You all right? How are you doing, Mark? You okay? Yeah. Very good, very good. So, first of all, mate, I obviously don't want to keep you here too long because I know you're a busy man. They've just finished training, the preparations for games coming up. Um, so, how did, because we've got some young viewers, can, can I take you through kind of like, like a quick inversion of your full journey? So, right at the start, how yes. did you first get into football? Because I know you're from okay, Bury, so... you grew up in Bury, didn't you, near Manchester? So, how did you first get into football? Yeah, so I grew up in Bury, Manchester. I moved, I moved down um, towards Peterborough direction. And at the age of 10, I was scouted by a Norwich City scout. Um, asked to go along on a trial. That trial lasted for three weeks over in Finland. Um, at the end of that trial, I was offered to, to continue coming into Norwich. Um, at, the age of, at the age of uh, 16, I was offered um, the opportunity to go and join the football club full time, which meant myself moving nearly 100 miles to Norwich, um, living in digs. And, and my career started from there. Um, but I was very fortunate. I was, I was with some very good people, some very good coaches. And, you know, these people set me along the, the, the steps in my life that I needed to become a professional footballer um, at the age of as you say, between 18, I, I represented England. We won the European Championships at 18. I was very fortunate to play with some very established players. So Campbell at Tottenham at the time, who went on to play for Arsenal, the Gary Neville, um, Paul Scholes, Nicky Butt, um, all of Man United. And then after that, I, at the age of eight, 19, I, I broke into the first team at Norwich and, and made my debut in the Premier League and went on to play 25 games or something that season. Subsequently, off the back of that, I then went to represent um, England at under-21s and was fortunate, again, to, to play with Gary Neville um, and then be playing with uh, David Beckham. So, um, you know, I, I'm fortunate in my era, I, I, I got to play with some very, very good uh, footballers. Yeah, wow. Well, obviously, some of their names there are, are, are people that are renowned in the game and will go down in history. So, for what what kind of a, an apprenticeship a, a kind of environment to be, be around and learn from. That's, that, that's, that's amazing. Very, very fortunate. And obviously, well, not fortunate because you clearly worked very hard to get there yourself, didn't you? And be, be amongst that crop of players. What, 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 what I learned from being among such established players, because then it went on to be um, people like Chris Kasperis, who played for Man United, Phil Neville, Gary's brother, um, uh, Robbie Fowler. And, you know, I was very fortunate. I had a very, very good, group of, of players and what that group of players taught me was the beliefs that they've been taught at playing for Liverpool, Man United, Tottenham, Arsenal, all the top teams. They consistently had the same work ethic. They consistently had the same outlook on how to be a footballer and how you had to conduct yourself. And they were things that, that my coaches were teaching me, but then I learned it as well from being around these older players your, your work rate, your attitude and your desire are three things that it doesn't come natural. It's something that you learn. And, and if you don't want to have that, or you haven't got the ability to have that, you're not going to succeed and get to the level that you think that you can get, that you can achieve. If you have them three things, 
you've got an opportunity that can push you along the way. And by learning them things, it gave me the best opportunity to have the best career that I could possibly have for the, for the, for the amount of ability that I, that I had. That's, that's, a great, that's a great answer, Marshy, because a lot of people, a lot of coaches in, in particularly grassroots and younger things, they think these kind of uh, individual unbelievable talents is just natural God-gifted uh, born. Um, so people like yourself and people who've been in the game a long time to so the highest level, they know that all, all kind of skills and attributes to make an all-round footballer or, or anyone in life, you can, you can learn all these things. It's just how much dedication you put to it. And then you kind of spring off these people. It might be your coaches. It might be these uh, play, your peers that are, are, are more talented and more advanced than you right now. You watch these people and you kind of buy into their qualities. And you, yeah, you, if you put the nail on the head there, that, that kind of uh, stops a lot of arguments about how, how things are naturally given to you. So it's your work rate that will get you everything. I've said it. I've said it a lot of times before, and I say it to a lot of players that I work with now as a coach. There was a lot more talented players than myself out there. I wasn't the most talented footballer, but what I did have was the things that I talked, told you: the desire, the work rate, the, the the ability to want to learn and listen. And you've got to have them because there were there were a lot better players than me. There were there were there were international goalkeepers that I was coming up against before I became an international goalkeeper. And these goalkeepers were better than me. They were more talented. But I had that extra, that extra little bit that, that I learned from having that desire, that work rate. And I got that from my coaches. And then when I got into the international scene, it doesn't surprise me that the likes of David Beckham had the career and achieved what he did do. But when you see him and you see him work when he used to train, he was the first on the training field and he was the last one to leave every single time. So it's no surprise yeah. that these type of players went on, on and had the careers that they had. It's no surprise. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, so obviously you're a coach now, so obviously a specialist goalkeeper coach, but the goalkeeper position has come on so much more now that it's, it's, you're, you are a coach. It's, it's your goalkeeper coach predominantly, but you're also a coach, you're part of the team, you're, you're helping, helping the manager kind of form things and so when you were younger with that in mind did you always want to be a goalkeeper or did you love football or, or was what we did play on pitch first I don't know no so from the age of I think about seven or eight I used to play outfield um I used to go to Cubs or Scouts whatever it's the you yeah. know the equivalent yeah. now yeah. and the, our goalkeeper left and somebody needed to go in goal so I went in goal and it just came naturally and within a short, very short period of time, I, I, I elevated myself to, you know, to be get spotted by by Norwich City. Um, but being a coach is something that I always wanted to do. Um, I had a very good coach when I was growing up. Well, from the age of around about 22, um, who taught me the professional game and taught me how to conduct myself not only as a player but as a professional coach. And learning from him, a guy called Malcolm Webster. It gave me the desire and the want to to also give something back in football. So as much as I, I loved my football career and I got everything I could do out of it, I always knew the next step was going to be the coaching career. And it's literally like a cycle. As you're growing up as a footballer and you're learning everything you need to learn as a footballer, I'm now learning that as a coach. And it's like the next step along your life what you learn as a footballer, you're now learning the similar sort of traits and, and things as, as a coach. And that's what I'm learning at this moment in time. And I started off at a fabulous club in Aston Villa. After I finished playing there, I spent four years playing. I then went on and spent just under four years as a coach there. And I had a fantastic time. I had a really good time. Le taught me a lot. Taught me a lot of principles, a lot about basics, morals and standards of a coach, not a footballer, as a coach. And when I got the opportunity to come with work with Lee Bowyer at Charlton, I was able to bring them principles with me and come into a football club at the time where Lee came in, myself came in, Johnny Jackson came in, where the club was in not in a good place. And we were able to implement them standards that I learned from the Premier League into League One, along with Lee me and him and Jacko had the same moral understandings of what we wanted to achieve. And yeah. by upping the levels of everything at this football club at Charlton, we've managed to initially get promotion 
and give ourselves a fighting chance of staying in, in the championship. So, yes, to of doing. Um, but fundamentally, I love working with the goalkeepers and making them understand what it is and what you need to achieve to become professional. But as you quite rightly say, my role is not just the goalkeepers. You're implemented as a coach now. And that's what Lee Bowie has been great. He's been great with myself. He's implementing me as part of his coaching team. He realises the benefit of a goalkeeper coach into a coaching role involving the players. And he's been very open-minded to it. And he's been great with me. Yeah, that's that's great. You've covered about ten questions in one there, Marshy. With uh, <laughs> uh, all, 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 always knew you could you did absolutely nail and anything we we throw at you. So as I was going to say about with, with us, I was a young pro at uh, Millwall together, and even then, yeah. as a young pro, you had them kind of all, them qualities. The, the organizer um, get the boys together, really, really kind of again. The, but you touched on it there about the professionalism, the standards on the football pitch, on and off the football pitch, you, you helped us youngsters with, but you also kind of uh, guided us and gave us tips and, and educated us really in the, in the game. So w- was that something that you, you, you kind of were getting a little bit older and you felt you were moving towards a coach or was it back, like you mentioned, when you were younger, you received that quality coaching in your, in your own game and you were just kind of passing on, on what you'd received. Yeah. It's, it's, it- it's, it's nice that you say them kind, them kind words about me, Mike, because it wasn't something that I was consciously coming and thinking I want to try and cope people. It wasn't that. What It was my principles that I had been taught from a young person, from a young channel. Um, all the stuff that I was taught from the coaches, which we spoke about earlier on. Um, and that was just, it's just my belief on how it should be done. That... For me to 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 play better, I need to help those players around me, in which in turn will help the team play better, and which hopefully will win more games. And that's just my belief of how how it needs to be. Um, whether it was probably indirectly, it was coaching, as you quite rightly say. But I, I was doing it for the reasons of helping myself and hope helping the players, which in turn would help the team. Um, and it was just something that was installed in me from a very young age, and it's just something that. I've always, always liked doing. Perfect, perfect. And um, just, just obviously, you've got your all-round knowledge now of a player and a coach. Back then, when you first got kind of got spotted by Norwich, what do you think that your strong attributes were that they spotted back then? Obviously, you're going to have a different opinion now, being a coach and a, a, an unbelievable career. But what do you think back then they spotted in you at that young age? Of, I believe you said 10, didn't you? Yeah, um, I can always remember. I can always remember being told what it was actually, Mark. Um, oh, yeah, they, 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 you know, the scout came around my house who who spotted me, and he came around and saw myself with my parents and my sister, and sat down and said, "Listen, I've come and seen you a couple of times." He says, "But what always stood out about about you was your bravery. Your bravery. You, yes, you make you, you'd make saves, blah blah blah. But you were brave, um, brave." Not only physically, where I'd stick my head into silly places and do all that silly stuff, but um, brave to make choices, brave to make make a decision. And they said it always stuck out with them. And that's why they took a chance that they decided they needed to have a look at me. So, yeah, I can remember it clearly. Perfect. Perfect. And I just want to touch a, touch a bit on, obviously, we talked about the, the qualities you feel players need. I think uh, the mindset is a really powerful thing because some you might – Everyone can achieve what they want, but if you, if you haven't got a positive mindset that, that you believe in yourself and and uh, uh, really go for it, you're kind of like shooting yourself in the foot before you've really started. So I want to use a little example where, obviously, you were at Norwich. I, I believe you were um, you won Player of the Year, didn't you? And um, then you you're uh, you made a move to Ipswich, um, which not many people. Uh, the youngest is watching, but obviously it's a bit, a bit of a rivalry, shall we, shall we say? Um, but they were in the Premier League. Um, I can understand as a, as a, as an ex player that that mindset and and that I'm guessing you wanted to obviously better yourself, challenge yourself at a high level, um, and really it was a real in, in individual kind of for yourself, be the best you can be, rather than looking at yeah. two teams hate each other. But what was your mindset to really take on that challenge? Um, and how can we kind of like help the kids with that mindset? Because that, that seems really powerful looking into me. 
okay, so um, we, we train every day physically um, to be the best we can. And we go in the gym to become as strong as we can. Um, cardiovascularly, we go outside on the pitch and do as much running and physical work to become the, the most elite we can do. Um, but for me, the strongest part is your mindset, like you quite rightly say. And a lot of the training that, that I do with the goalkeepers, not only is it physically and not only technically, but it's about getting the mindset right. And, you know, you go back to the time that I left Norwich, as you say, as player of the season, and I'd had a good time at that football club and it served me well and I served it well. Um, and then I made the move and went across the Ipswich. Um, the mentality was I knew I was going to get a lot of stick from certain fr fractions of fans from Norwich. Um, I wasn't sure how the Ipswich fans were going to react to me. In fairness, they reacted fantastically and took me on board. Um, but it became very much, I had to just, for me to deal with it, I had to just go back into my own little world and deal all about me. I couldn't worry and think about anything externally. I wouldn't look at it. Social media was different then, okay? But if I was dealing with it now, I wouldn't have looked at any social media. I never read the papers. I yeah. never listened to the news. I wasn't interested in it because it had to become, as selfish as it sounds, it had to become about me. Because if I let anything externally come into my life and, and, and it was going to have a negative effect on how I played. And that was the best way that I could deal with it. I understand how the society and life has moved on with social media and at the click of, click of a button, anything can happen. But I think there's too many people in society that are too bothered about posting what's going on in their life rather than dealing with what's actually going on in their life. Yeah. Deal with what's actually in front of you because all the other stuff will come along at any point anyway. So there's no need to be posting stuff and trying to get adoration. Adoration will come your way if you do things right anyway. So as a footballer, you don't need to be seeking adoration off the pitch. Because when you're playing well on it, it will come anyway. Perfect, perfect. Very wise, wise words there um, from obviously Andy, who's at the top of the game in at Charlton. Um, predominantly, that, that advice is aimed at aimed at the kind of older children and stuff like that. But it's wise words for for you throughout your career, really, um, to be the best you can be. Um, I really like that. Um, so in them younger years, touching on the mindset again, obviously a goalkeeper is probably the most pressurised position in terms of mindset and how you can face challenges and, and overcome them. How did you personally, how did you deal with difficult times? It may be losing a game, making a mistake, or obviously with a goalkeeper, it usually ends up in uh, conceding, the, conceding the goal. How, how did you do, deal with that as a youngster? And then how do you kind of teach your, so two parts of the question, how did you deal with that personally as a youngster and in your career playing? And how do you help your players now with that? Okay, so when I was a youngster, I think one thing's got to be made clear, fellow, and you'll know this as well as every other professional, you will always make a mistake. They will all, you will make a mistake in your career. It's going to happen, and it will happen again, and it will happen again. And it's how you come back from that, and it's how you deal with it. So asking that question is absolutely spot on. And as a youngster, how I deal with it, if a mistake happened in the game, I'd switch it off, switch my mindset off, reset my mind and go again, all within seconds. I'm talking seconds here. So mistakes happen. I'd quickly think about the mistake, switch off my mind, then I'm back on with the game and do not think about what just happened. All I'm then thinking about is positive thoughts. What can I do to, 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 to have a positive impact on the next part of my game? And that is all I would think about. And the next time I'm getting the ball, I'm giving it to somebody else as simple and basic as possible. I don't want to do anything flash. I'm going to do the next thing the most simple, basic way because that will get my confidence back up again. And it was no different to when I then became a professional and then you're playing in front of X amount of people for playing for whoever. If you make a mistake, the next thing you do has got to be the most basic thing ever to get your confidence back up again. Don't try and correct a mistake that's already happened. Don't try and go for a ball that maybe you wouldn't go for. Don't try and think you've then got to try and do something to make up for that mistake. You don't. You have to get through the game. It's as simple as that. 
because you will build your confidence up by keeping things simple. And by building your confidence up, your natural game will come back again. So that's how I dealt with it as a youngster. That is the same way how I dealt with it as a pro. But the best thing these days where we're at is people like myself, full-time professional coaches, we're there for the, for the players. Now, I've got the best example you could possibly ever have of a player that I work with making the biggest mistake on the biggest occasion in Dylan Phillips in the playoff final last season when the ball rolled under his foot after seven minutes and went into the back of the net from a back pass from his own defender. Now, throughout that whole season, our training was about improving Dylan, making sure he minimises his mistakes and how he deals with his mistakes when they happen. And that's what his whole training was about. And it's no different now. We do the same thing. And I said to him, I sat him down a couple of months before the end of the season. And I said, you will make a mistake. And you can make it on the grandest scale. You might make it on the most smallest scale. But what happens is how you come back from that. Because mistakes will happen. Ironically, he made it on the grandest scale. But the best thing that happened was after 15 minutes, which was eight minutes after that mistake had happened, he makes a save down to his left-hand side, which then totally changes the whole game. And all of a sudden, the team relaxes. He relaxes. We start playing. We went on and win the game 2-1. And because of how he dealt with that mentally, he boxed it off. He knew he was a good goalkeeper. He went back to his basic game, kept his game simple. He was then able to overcome it, get us promoted, now earning more money than what he was earning in the previous league, now playing at a higher level that he was playing on ever, and now getting adoration for, for, for his performances in the championship. And that's down to him and his work rate and his, and his mentality of how he can deal with it. That's, that's a brilliant example for all the youngsters. Um, mistakes do happen. I always try to tell the youngsters that you, you cannot do anything about it. You can't change it. It's happened. So why, why waste any time thinking about it? Register it. Like, like you said, move on. Remember, you are a good player. That No one means to make mistakes. Not one person in, in, in the world will mean to make any mistake in their life. But it's a, it's a real chance to learn afterwards. Obviously, at the highest level, which you're talking about, it's a little bit more critical. Um, but as a youngster... There's, there's no point of wasting time, negative energy. Just think about the next thing and then maybe use it as a learning experience afterwards when you're reflecting on it. So, yeah, great example, Andy. Thanks for that, mate. Absolutely. Um, so, we um, so just to kind of touch on what was it like? You, you touched on it before, but what was it like playing for, the, for your country? So, you talked about all the, all the kind of um, attributes. You've worked your socks off. You've, 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 your desire, your mindset's right. What did you set goals to play for your country? Did you want to play? Obviously, I'm guessing you want to play the highest level. Um, so when that kind of happened with the 18s and the 21s, because I know you played a few games in the, in the 21s. Um, wow, what an experience! How how did that? What was it, what was it like? And how did that kind of spur you on mentally to want to achieve even more in the game? Yeah, it's um, you, you don't ever realise what is fully involved until you play at national level and um when you're playing in front of the crowds and, and again, I listen, I'm going to re rewind and it wasn't what it is now. And, you know, the adoration for football these days is a lot more than what it was when I had it, but it was still amazing when I had it. But to, to, to be able to have your national anthem playing and, and, and you're playing your games and you're singing that and, and you're playing with the elite players in, in, in your age group at your national level, it's, it's what you dream of when you're growing up. It, the same way when, when we went on to the FA Cup final, these are the sort of things that you dream about as you're growing up that you want to achieve. And, and when you're actually there and it's happening and it's in your face, it's a, it is a reality check. And it really is. And it's just, a, it's just a complete pleasure and a privilege to have represented my country. Brilliant. 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 Um, just, for, just for the guys who are watching online, um, Feel free to kind of chuck some uh, questions into the comments and we'll try to get through one or two at some point. Um, so with, with moving on to your, your, your kind of coaching side now, with your wealth of experience as a player, um, do you, you touched on it as well, do you feel this has helped you as a coach or do you feel that the, the, the perspective of the game has changed 
being a player and a coach, or do you feel like it's like you say it's a whole new learning curve and you're almost starting again? Um, how how is it from yeah. going from being a player to a coach? I, I, I don't think you can ever have enough experience, um, particularly if you've had a playing experience and you're able to and you're able to take that into the next step of coaching. Um, you know, when particularly like this season, I've got a young Dylan Phillips um, and I've got young goalkeepers at this football club all the way down through to the under 16s that, that, that I'm, I'm, I'm looking after. And then under 16s downwards, I've got Darren Ibrahim at the Charlton um, and Peter Lodge who help look after them young lads. So we have a full involvement with all the goalkeepers at all age groups. But I know come match day when Dylan's playing in front of 20, 30, 40,000 people, I know what he's feeling. I know exactly what he's feeling. I know exactly the mood that he's in. And, you know, if he's having a tough time, I, I know how, hopefully, how to deal with it with him. Uh, hopefully, I can say the right, the right words to him yeah. or do the right motions that I need to do in training, in warming him up in the game to, to get him ready for the game. So, you know, you can't ever have enough experience. And if that experience means that it's playing or coaching, you, you can't ever have enough. But where, where the next step where I say when I came into my coaching side is, is I can take my experience as a player and bring that along into my coaching. But it's almost like you are starting all over again in your football career, but on the coaching side of it. But I've got the added experience of, of the level that I played at and for the length of time. Yeah, yeah. No, brilliant, brilliant. And um, obviously a, a massive asset for Charlton Football Club and I'm sure hopefully the season gets sorted out in some kind of way. And, um, Let's hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, things go, get back to the positive. Um, obviously, with your so with your playing career, you've even had a, a caretaker role at Aston Villa, didn't you? Um, a caretaker manager, um, very briefly. Yeah. And, and, and the yeah. coaching roles at Villa and, and Charlton. What would so if we if we focus on mainly kind of like seven to fifteen or sixteen year olds, you touch on a couple of couple of the, the three main points, but I don't even mind if we just echo them again if they're the same points. But with all your experience, all your playing uh, coaching knowledge, what would you be for, for kind of the kids at my six soccer academy and, and and the kids watching who wherever they are or even parents? What would be your kind of main tips um, to really really help? I think they're fundamental in life, really, the same as football, uh, to, to, to achieve what, whatever their goals may be. Yeah, OK. So, um, fundamentally, you have to listen. You have to have the ability to listen and absorb not only what coaches are saying, but what people say to you in life. And then you will make that decision whether you think the information that you're being told is the correct information. And, and, it's, and it's, if you cannot take that information on then you may be going to find it a little bit tough so it's about taking on that information also it's about work rate you've got to be able to work hard yeah. because without hard work you're not going to get to where you want to get to and trust for me work and trust are the two main things that, that I've got to implement into being a goalkeeper Without hard work, I can't trust you. Without trust, you will never work hard. And it's as simple as that. They're the two main things. Obviously, I've just explained about hearing and listening and taking on board. But trust and hard work, for me, are the two main things. They're the two things that I taught from eight-year-old players all the way up to senior players. And I say it, I said it to Dylan Phillips when I first started working with him. I have to trust you. You have to trust me. You have to work hard for me and I have to work hard for you. It has to be a two-way thing. And that is the same all the way through to our youngest player. And it makes no difference because I, I can't trust somebody who's not willing to work hard. Because if they're not willing to work hard, they just simply can't be trusted. And vice versa. They have to trust me and I have to earn their trust. It's important that the players that I'm working with, that they trust me as their coach. They trust me whether I'm their manager or, or whatever. There has to be that element of trust there. Perfect. So they're the two core fundamentals for me, Mark. Hard work and trust. 
Perfect. Thanks, Andy. And, and, and your answer there just kind of made me got, got me thinking about the actual coaches or our, our academy, because um, as, as, as you know, when we as, as boys and girls, when we're growing up, we can kind of uh, it's quite hard to take on information, isn't it? We, we kind of uh, think that people are against us or, or they're having a go. Us or talking. What tips would you give to my coaches um, um, to kind of help the players and gain that trust um, so they these players know that we're coming from a professional background. We we know what it takes. We we ultimately want the best for them, and that's why we're there coaching because we want to nurture their their talent. Um, how can we get across to them that we're a team and, and we're working together, like you said, and get the best out of them rather than them feeling you're dictating almost? Okay, so a lot of it is about the coaching team singing off the same hymn sheet. So the the team that we've got here, very much right from day one it became very obvious that we had the same um, outlook on life. We had the same outlook on football. We had the same fundamentals and core beliefs in what we believe football should be about. And that is what we're about. And we treat every single person with honesty and respect. We've always been completely honest with them. Whether they've liked it or not, we've been straight, open and honest with them. And sometimes we've had it where, you know, we've upset players. And you will have it as a coaching team that you might have to sometimes upset people by being completely straight and honest with them. And they might not like it, but fundamentally, they will turn around and say, well, at least they're being straight and honest with me. And that is the core fundamentals where you have to work as, as a coaching team. Now, we also then have to teach them the stuff that maybe some of the stuff they might not want to hear. And they might not believe in fully. And it's about our beliefs. We have to implement our beliefs into the players that they trust what we're telling them, that they take it out onto a match day and they see the difference. And when they see the difference on a match day and they listen to what you're saying and they, then they can liaise between what you're telling them and what's happening on a match day and the difference, they will then start to trust you. So that's how we've worked as a coaching team. And we've figured out that by being that way, that's what got us so such a tight knit team together. And yeah. obviously, listen, football moves on and things will happen in football out of your control. But the core fundamentals of what you're trying to be and what you're trying to achieve, they can't change. They can't. They have to stay the same. So as long as you've got a team there that believe in what you're all about and what you're all trying to achieve, and then you can be, you can implement that onto your players that take that onto a pitch. Eventually, hopefully, you should start to reap the rewards of it. Perfect. And um, uh, are we are we allowed to talk about uh, what's going to happen tomorrow with your your team and, and your game? Are we allowed to take a think about that? Um, I think I think it's probably wise that we don't talk about that at this moment in time. Cool, cool, perfect. No, no problem. Um, well, for, on behalf of everyone who's watching, and, and, and obviously myself and, and the kids in my academy, uh, thanks so much, for, mate, for for coming on and giving us uh, your words of wisdom and, and, no and knowledge. Because, um, guys, that whatever level a professional footballers played at, and um, obviously like Andy, the highest level for his country, tap into these kind of guys. That that we're here. That we, we're going to coach him to help ultimately and to progress players to 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 overachieve more than we probably ever achieved <laughs> uh, that's probably a good way of putting it um so really with his help ask questions ask questions work as hard as you can because it's almost like a, a school if, if you see someone really kind of working and they try their hardest they might you might be struggling at skill you might be st struggling at technique but we see that and we recognize and we buy into it as well we passionately want to help and, and, and improve you so thanks very much andy um Great work today, mate, no and um, all the best for the weekend. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Cheers, mate. Speak Thanks. to you soon. Bye-bye.